Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Decentralized Distributed and Disruptive Technology Summit. I am so glad that you are joining us today. We have a wonderful program lined up for you, and I can guarantee that you are going to get a whole lot out of it. This is part of the Greater Reset Activation. It's phase one of the Greater Reset Activation 2 which is the people's response to the World Economic Forum's Great Reset Agenda. What's that all about? Well, essentially, it's a marketing plan for New World Order 2.0. For quite a long time, there has been an effort to increase totalitarianism and centralization in this world from the likes of the Rockefellers and the Bilderbergs and the United Nations Council on Foreign Relations. Many people are familiar with this. Well, nowadays the technology exists to really usher in some pretty frightening things. Part of the Great Reset Agenda is called the Fourth Industrial Revolution, which essentially aims to merge biology and technology, not just human life, but all biodiversity on earth. And that's a very not, not good thing. So we want to counter that, right? The World Economic Forum is putting forward the fourth industrial revolution. We want to counter that with the first decentralized evolution. And this is already something that's organically taking place with decentralized technologies, encryption, decentralized blockchain. But during this program, we want to highlight the first decentralized evolution, and we want to take it a step further. We want to accelerate it. That's right. The Greater Reset Activation, that whole world effort movement, it's all about activism. It's about action. It's about doing. There are so many people that focus on the problem, research the problem, become overwhelmed. Well, we want to understand the problem, but understand it in the context that we can strategize so as to work around it, so as to opt out of it. And that's what we're going to be doing today. The topic for today is opting out of the fourth industrial revolution. Let's go and bring up our first speaker. What we like to do with the Greater Reset, it's really focused on solutions and activation, but we are also going to be presenting the problem and who better yet to really underline the nature of the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution than our good friend Anthony Mueller of the Mises Org and uh, Continental Economics. Anthony, how are you today? Thank you. Thank you. I'm fine. Great being here. Thank you for your invitation. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, we look forward to hearing from you and, and learning what the Fourth Industrial Revolution is all about. So go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you. Well, thanks a lot for for being here. Uh, I fully agree with the intention of this conference. That's been uh, in my heart for a long, long time that we are going down the wrong path towards more centralization, towards more state control. And also, it's almost all too clear how wrong this path is. There is still lacking a strong counter movement. And uh, so this conference, I think, really is amazing. Uh, and I would like to thank the organizers for going ahead and bring an alternative view into focus. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about a fourth industrial revolution, freedom or ty tyranny. Uh, one can also say impoverishment uh, or uh, prosperity. Yes, uh, we have to be for freedom, of course, because we love liberty, because it's an essential uh, aspect of our life. But uh, even uh, along with that, uh, being against freedom also, interesting enough, means to reduce our prosperity. So what we have to offer by decentralization, decentralization, less state, less government, more capitalism, is not only more freedom, more liberty, 
but also more prosperity. Well, over the past 200 years, since the first industrial revolution, uh, technology has already transformed our lives more than in the thousands of years of history uh, before. And probably, probably uh, in, the, in the future, in the decades to come, we will experience a new form of fundamental uh, transformation. And it is more or less so in our hands, uh, whether it will be the path to freedom and prosperity or poverty, uh, despair, and uh, unfreedom and tyranny. Well, uh, the point to keep in mind is that these great movements that we had with the first industrial revolution and now the two, second, third, or fourth, some economists only count two industrial revolutions, others count seven or eight or whatever, it does not matter. The present uh, fourth, usually called fourth industrial revolution, will do the same as the others before, uh, impulse, give a huge impulse uh, to productivity. Now, what may be what may be the difference is that in the first industrial revolution the productivity happened first primarily in agriculture and the access labor in agriculture could easily move to the industrial cities and find many workplaces better paid and also uh, more agreeable than working uh, in, in, on the land uh, for these masses of people flooding into the cities. Of course, the cities at first too were crowded, but over time the prosperity uh, was clearly visible and this prosperity in the industrial cities also spilled back over to those who left uh, over, who, who stayed on, in the countryside. Now, uh, the present industrial revolution may have an equal or even more impact on productivity, that is liberate labor force. But the problem seems to be, where do these persons go to? Where will be their, their jobs? And what kind of jobs will there be as this new kind of uh, industrial revolution also uh, not only leads to a robotization of the industrial plans, but moves on also in so-called sophisticated area, yeah, accounting, uh, legal services, and uh, even in, in the medical area. Now, uh, so this would mean that all our present system in terms of education, schooling, universities, diplomas, etc., et uh, get more or less obsolete. And also that the impact of the, of the economic policy, which is job creation, economic growth, and the welfare state, the subsidies, uh, price controls, etc., cetera, yeah, uh, will become the wrong path. Now, what can show up uh, uh, as far as we can see it right now without uh, neither scaremongering nor having too much illusions about the chances that show up? The outstanding effect, so it seems, of the new industrial revolution is a gigantic leap in productivity. Now, productivity has this positive side that with less labor, I get more. Or one can also say, with the same product that I produce, I need less time. So productivity is two-sided. I can use the same input of hours 
and get more output, or I keep my output constant and I'm liberated to have less input. And input in this, when we use labor, our, our work is less labor. It is something that we all might agree is a fine thing. Uh, it is nice not to have uh, the treadmill of working 40 hours or more uh, per week and have more spare time. The problem is, and this is the point, it's not the spare time that is bad or not being uh, liberated, of course, from work. That is a problem. But the problem is, to put it quite simply, <clears throat> how to pay my bills when I work less? And how do I get an adequate salary? We have the strange phenomenon that different from my youth, when it was still amazingly rare that uh, two parents uh, were, were working, uh, now you have it almost common, particular in the professional uh, uh, range uh, that uh, husband and wife are both uh, working because to a certain extent <clears throat> they have to uh, because the costs of rearing children has grown so much. So we have strange paradoxical situations in our present system that we are usually forced to work so much, not to get so much more goods, yes, but just to pay the bills that come in with health bills, old age insurance, and so on, paying the taxes, paying for regulation, and so on. Now, uh, how can we get out of this problem? And to me, it seems that we have to get rid of our current a political uh, and governmental system, which is tuned and which, which was formed in this past industrial era. Uh, let's call it the first industrial revolution. There has been a great change from the pre-industrial world to the industrial world. And now what we have is this kind of economic policy, social security, just take social security. It's absolutely tuned to working class. You have working class, you have a middle class, you have an upper class. Middle class can take care of itself. They have enough money, yes, to provide health services and old age. And of course, the upper class has wealth. And so we have to take care of the working class. Uh, lower class in this sense did not exist, but it was the working class because this industrial uh, sector uh, absorbed uh, this huge amount of people. And as soon as people came into the, or immigrants in the United States came, they were absorbed by this system. And the system then provided certain kinds of old age pension regulations, healthcare, uh, job security to a certain extent. And our system is tuned to that. Now, the whole of the industrial policy and the economic policy is tuned to avoiding a depression, a, a crisis. So it's all used. We must maintain full employment, full employment, full employment, because without full employment, the whole system is in danger of collapsing. Now, this, this would be the wrong policy now, because if you're still focused on full employment, you're doing exactly the wrong thing, because we want to work less. We want to be freer. The problem is not uh, work. The problem is how to sustain ourselves and get enough funds. And so uh, we have to change our, our whole focus of, of, of the policy to get to this very simple, very clear point that the old or uh, uh, traditional uh, aims of, of, of policy make no longer any sense. Now. And even now, now 
in terms uh, when confronted with a crisis, the, the risk is even that that they expand. Now it's social justice coming in. Yes, we have to integrate the poor. So it's getting more and more. And we have to, of course, to take care of the older people, of the elder people ever more. And now we have a vaccine problem. It's getting huger and huger. And before we look around, we notice we have landed in socialism. We have landed in a centralized system. We have landed in a, so in a socialist system with the consequence of poor economic performance, which is quite obviously always uh, less economic performance over the past decades, more centralization, more frustration, more problems instead of less problems. And this is the wrong way. This is obviously the wrong way. I mean, one could write thick books, as, uh, as I have tried with my book about capitalism, yes, to, to do that, that it's, we, we have a, a mass of all, all these old failed policies, and still they are brought up again and again, and, and uh, this way we do not uh, move forward. The collectivist policies uh, have not worked, yes, and they won't uh, work better uh, in the future, and, uh, even more so. They will be uh, detrimental to our prosperity. And the risk is very strong, yes. Uh, uh, and now here comes uh, the point to see that when the, the nation state is about to fail, yeah, the natural reaction that we are for, so to speak, would be to decentralize, to move towards more capitalism. But what is happening now? In face of the failure of the so-called nation state, we, we go up to an even higher level and the one world order, new world order, one world government. And uh, as, as the, the so-called pandemic has already shown very, very clearly, uh, who governs, who governs? Yes, yeah, this old question, who are the rulers? And one will see that it is not even your local or state or federal government, but main decision making took place at the World Health Organization level, which is somewhat a part of the United Nations, but not even a full-bodied member of the United Nations that would be called, okay, it's an international political organization. Yeah, so this is uh, amazing what has happened. Now, when you work, for example, in education, as I have been doing for quite some time, you note uh, that main lines of what to teach, how to teach, uh, what ethics to apply come from the UNESCO, the United States Educational and Scientific Organization. Now, I always worked, I also worked at the, in the financial markets. And now where are you looking at? The IMF in international economics, international finance, the International Monetary Fund, yes? So we have a number of supranational and international organizations, supranational, super uh, is 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 the the, the uh, European Union, for example, and as a, a pre-step to this world government, and uh, one can clearly see, and uh, I think in this respect, the so-called pandemic is a is a, a great lesson to see how how bad. Uh, these institutions uh, do with the lives of the people. It is a sad thing that has happened. Uh, one can say that the World Health Organization, by its policy recommendation, policy order, whatever, yeah, has destroyed half of the world economy and has put 
millions of people into deprivation. I mean, just imagine, no, no national state, no regional state would have done this. No community would, would do this with its population. But some guys, they are in Geneva, interesting enough, they are not in New York, the World Health Organization, uh, from Switzerland. They are exterritorial, interesting enough, they can't even be persecuted by, by the Swiss police, yes. And then they sit there and give orders, yeah, to do this and that and to recognize this, and this is a pandemic by changing definitions. And the national governments follow that like a military order and apply horrendous measures to their own population without really taking into account that these suggestions or orders may be totally wrong and uh, uh, ineffective, uh, whatever the purpose is, when it goes, uh, for example, uh, about, about when it's about health and, and so on. So, uh, even, and now we, we see, ne, even uh, the so called uh, Western countries uh, submitted to this new uh, assault. And uh, the executive branch took directly uh, the orders, uh, applied these orders, recommendations, suggestions, whatever you may call, and there was hardly any resistance from the side of the parliaments, of, of, of the legislative branch. There was no resistance from the judicial branch, even though individual rights were deeply concerned. And also the resistance, let's say, from uh, industrial associations uh, was, was very, very uh, uh, muted. Uh, uh, so we, we can observe that with such a hierarchical system uh, that is no longer regional or state or national or international, but global, yes, you, you have a dictatorship almost overnight because you have persons that are uh, in immediately not countable. Uh, your local member of the uh, community of the municipality, you meet uh, on the street, your congressman you can uh, talk to. But uh, how can anyone talk to the members of the WHO? What is going on here? And how do you address your president or chancellor or prime minister uh, when he says, well, that was uh, the advice uh, from the World Health Organization. Uh, everybody did it. You know, this reminds of this kind of excuse, I was just following orders. And now I was just following your orders. You may hear from your prime minister or your president. Imagine what's going on. It's so outrageous, it's so mind-boggling, maybe because it is so absurd and so beyond anything to believe that the people are still paralyzed, yes, and still have not the grips in their minds to really see what is going on. And of course, they live from promise to promise. The next promise is, yes, the recovery, recovery is just around the corner. Well, we will see what will happen in the next couple of months and years to, to come. Now, what would be, what could be the alternative? And uh, I am a <clears throat> adherent of let's call it anarcho-capitalism, which simply means a kind of capitalism with almost no 
state interference, yeah, anarcho without a ruler, without hierarchy. Let's just have free market, yes, uh, on the one side. Now, free markets give us prosperity, give us productivity, and give us freedom. That's it. Yes. And now the problem is there are some forms of living together where we need certain kind of yeah, rules or a certain order. We need some kind of general laws. Yes, less is more, is better. Yes, in this sense. But nevertheless, we need some kind of uh, organizing, ordering our, our communities. Now, for in history even, uh, among the, the Greek democracy, uh, was already the idea of what Hayek called demarchy or government by lot. Yes, my simple suggestion, because I'm much concerned about, yeah, about economic policy, uh, international relations, and so on. So, how can we change this party politics, this 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 uh, hateful and and full a system full of lies and cheat that that we have in politics, and everybody knows it. I mean, uh, one does not need to to to, to show up with with details about it. It's systematic disease, systematic lying, yes, and systematic craziness. Yeah, what whoever you like, uh, the f previous or the present president, I mean, you can make your choice uh, about uh, what kind of people, uh, whether you like it or not, you have your favorite, whatever. But look look at the one before or, 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 or who is now and, and you know what, what, what I mean. So we, we, have, we have this kind of problem of, of surely uh, having a lack of, of understanding uh, about the problems of the people, aloofness uh, in, in the political sector. So uh, uh, what I have developed and try to promote also in, in, in some of my books, and I'm preparing a new ed edition about that, is to have a system where uh, you have a lottery and uh, of representatives. Yes, and, and statistically, we need, uh, even if you want to represent the United States, we need about 2,000 representatives, true representatives, yes, that are selected, yes, regularly, uh, and then they go back into the community, so they are not professional politicians, yes, and these would be the assembly, that would be the legislative branch. And they would hire government business companies, consulting companies, who would execute. But they would have the power. Now, we could go move to such a system simply by installing such a thing besides the present system. So you would have some kind of similarity to the upper house uh, for earlier upper house in, in Britain, where, where they could sanction laws. Just think about that, that we would have delegates chosen by lot for a limited time, let's say one and a half years only, and then they move back to the society, but they have special information, they have special access and so on, and they can judge what is going on and they have a veto right. Yes, uh, just imagine, great disasters would have been prevented in the past where politicians pursued certain ideas. And if we had had such uh, a, a people's assembly, yeah, that just had a veto right, yes, uh, many economic follies and international uh, policy follies and economic policy follies would have been uh, 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 prevented. So uh, that so-called demarchy, or sedition uh, would be would be a way out uh, of the of the uh, dilemma that we face. So there is a chance, but the path must go towards 
liberty, towards capitalism, and towards decentralization to maintain and regain our liberty and also to uh, maintain and regain now that that will be the great task we have to face uh, our prosperity thank thanks a lot all right thank you so much for joining us today that was a lot of really good information i really appreciate your perspective on everything there antony Thank you. Okay, excellent. Yeah, keep up the good work. We'll be sharing your articles and your links throughout the stream so folks can see some of the research that you've put together. And uh, again, I really appreciate, I, I imagine as soon as you learned about the Great Reset, you just kind of shifted some of your focus to that because you've really been pumping out a lot of good articles and essays about that. So keep up the good work. Okay, I'll try to. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. Okay, thank you. You take care. All right, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Anthony Mueller, that was great, excellent talk. I really, one of the great things that I appreciated from the talk was the fact that the further away power and authority is from the people, when you centralize power up at the international level, the supranational level, there's less accountability right? Even with local and state, I mean, the city government here in Austin, Texas, they all live in the West Austin wealthy neighborhood, almost every single one of them. But at least you run into them every once in a while at the grocery store, right? And if they turn into total tyrants, they have to face the people, right? And then each level outward that you go, there's less connection with the people that are being governed. And when it comes to a central government, like the United States, great big geographic area, all the way up in Washington, DC, so many rules are being made. There's no accountability. And now as we see the fourth industrial revolution coming into play, there's going to even be a shift away from democratic Republican forms of government. Not that we even really have that. It's more of an oligarchy really. But it's going to be a shift away from this representative traditional form of governance where you elect politicians, and they make decisions, terrible concept anyway, terrible model. I'm for self-governance. And it's going to shift to being ruled by scientific elite and different autonomous organizations and entities and code and smart contracts. So we need to be cautious of that. And the thing that we can do to bring the power back is to focus on decentralizing systems, opting out of those systems. I also want to point out too, um, what we like to present here with the Greater Reset is a diverse diversity of ideas, right? So I myself am a fan of capitalism and the fruits of capitalism, although I see that we have crony capitalism and this mercantilism that's in place, right? I consider myself an agorist and voluntarist at heart, but we want to welcome all different systems, except for maybe fascism and communism and technocracy, which we oppose. But there's who knows what the right way to organize a society is or the best economic system. I think the, the number one thing that we can do is have a default foundation of freedom, foundation for a free society where different types of experimentations and systems can coexist peacefully. And we have the exact opposite of that with where things are going. They want to have a total top-down hierarchical system. So, we are going to continue on with the stream. I want to thank everyone that's tuned in on the website, thegreaterreset.org slash live, thegreaterreset.org slash live. That's the number one place we want to invite you to tune in. You can also watch on DLive on Float, one of our sponsors. We'll tell you more about them later, uh, as well as my uh, YouTube channel, Live Free Now YouTube channel. So definitely check us out. Share these streams with all of your friends.